Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Nikon Creators Hour. My name is Mike Corrado. I am your host for this interview that we have upcoming with Mr. Nicholas Bruno. Um, we are here to create some amazing content for you that's inspirational and educational. And Nicholas certainly has an amazing story and backstories to the images he shares. So let me welcome to the Creators Hour, Nicholas Bruno. Nick, how are you doing? I'm good. Thanks, Mike. I'm really excited to be here and share a lot of background on my work and just talk with you about cameras and everything. It's going to be fun. Yeah, we love that. And, and, and thank you for giving us your time and putting together a collection of images that we're about to talk about. Um, these have been some crazy times, and we certainly thank you for giving us your time to, uh, to talk about the work that you do. And for those of you out there that are tuning in, uh, a lot of the work Nicholas does is based on a condition that he has, and we're going to talk about all of that uh, in the way of something called sleep paralysis. So I thank you for sharing some of these personal things with us um, over the next hour uh, or so, and, um, and I know it's kind of tough. Uh, to talk about at times, but this uh, is certainly, uh, I've known you for how many years now? Quite a few years now. Yeah. So I, I love the fact that we can come together, right? Um, it's been really cool to just like know you for that long and like I follow your journey, you follow mine and we've been able to share mm -hmm. our stories together. It's, it's really inspiring. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really great and um, it has been nice to work with you at different trade shows and do different panel discussions and um, and telling your story and the backstory to these images is going to be very, very important. Uh, I, I would love to know how you're doing now and how you've been doing over the last several months during the pandemic. I mean, has that altered your work uh, or have you continued to work and, and work on self-portraits? You know, I, I work independently, so it hasn't been that much of a shift for me. But I guess um, with my gallery closing and all different sorts of income closing has been difficult. But I've been in my studio just working, sketching, and like I've kind of been treating this whole quarantine period as a sort of like an artist residency, like forced art, artist residency where I go to my studio each day and I work and I sketch and I build props and I've just been really on the grind, like figuring out what, what's, what are my goals, what am I driving to do and just working really hard on refining those skills during that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, that's going to be one of the more interesting parts of the conversations here is uh, what people will, will come to realize is that, you know, this is like a, a building box of work for you. Like, you don't just go out there and make a picture. Um, it's all based on, you know, the sleep paralysis and the dreams, but there's a whole building of, you know, the drawings that you do, the concepts that you have, the building of the props, the getting the props to location. So, you know, I just I want everybody to understand out there tuning in that this is it's quite a bit of work from the conception of the, the photo to the end result and what you go through. And I can't wait to hear the stories. But let's start uh, at the beginning of young Nicholas's career um, in the sense of when did you first pick up a camera and become fascinated with the notion of photography? Sure. Yeah. So I remember being like five, six years old. My mom would buy me those little point and shoot cameras and I would I would shoot a bunch of them. She'd take them to CVS or whatever, and she'd develop them for me. And I'd look at these pictures, and I'd be like, wow, this is the coolest thing ever. And I have, like, a whole bunch of collections downstairs. And um, I look through them from time to time just to see what I was looking at when I was doing this. But I was mostly just fascinated with the process of shooting, developing it, and then having something that I could show everybody that I did. Um, and then I went to middle school. I, loved, I fell in love with Photoshop there. And I would experiment with Photoshop, take images from online. And then once I went to high school, I started taking a digital photography class. And that's where I started taking my own images, putting them into Photoshop and messing around with them, figuring out the tools and becoming really just fascinated with that process as well. It was something completely different than the film that I did when I was a little kid. Um, but as I was in that art class and I went into 10th grade, uh, I started suffering from sleep paralysis pretty much every single night where... I would wake up and I'd be frozen in my bed and I would see these hallucinations, whether it be a man walking through my room, somebody hovering above my bed, me being frozen and being sucked into my mattress. Um, all these dreams started happening to me almost every single night and I didn't know what it was. So I was suffering in school. I couldn't keep my grades up, but my photography class and my art classes were really kind of my escape of the whole day because I was failing my math class, science class, but Art was somewhere where I could actually jump in and just kind of express what was going on with me. Even though I wasn't really sharing what was going on at that time, it was just a good release for me because I really had no escape because as soon as I would go home and go to bed, I would go into another one of these dreams. So 
art was really my escape in that regard. And then my art teacher, he recommended to start keeping a dream journal of all these experiences because he was kind of like my, my, my mentor, almost like my therapist in a way, but not to that regard. But um, I started keeping this journal and I would write down everything that I would see every single night, whether it be that character standing above my bed or a woman in a dress that floats across the room and she shrieks in my ear. Um, all these things I started documenting, whether it be through a drawing or through just writing down what it was. And by a month or two, I looked through it. I'm like, this is, this is pretty crazy. I have a whole log of what's been going on. And my teacher encouraged me to kind of turn these into self portraits, kind of put myself in that position where I can take hold of that, that scenario but recreate it in a positive light so that's where this idea of art to therapy well yeah it's like an art as therapy um, exercise began for me and um, I started doing this and I ended up submitting to the Huntington Camera Club which is sponsored by Nikon in high school and that's where I met you and that's where I, I won my that. first camera with one of my my images that I shot and from there, I got my first Nikon D60, and that was my real camera. I wasn't borrowing my mom's camera anymore. And right. that was, like, the key to my journey of, of photography. Like, it just exploded from there. So, uh, what was the art teacher's name? Mr. Matty Yunus. Yeah, I want to give him a shout-out. because He's awesome. Um, certainly, uh, if, if he wants to tune in and be proud of his uh, student, that's a, a very, very cool thing. I want to delve into sleep paralysis a little bit more. Were you medically diagnosed uh, to have this condition? Because I can tell you, and I know a lot of people feel the same way, doesn't happen to me a lot, but I, I, I can describe what you described before. I feel like I'm sleeping, but I feel like I'm awake. My body won't move no matter what I do. And I've learned through the years of this happening to just at a certain point concede to it, meaning don't fight it. I try to force myself awake and I don't fight it. And when I tend to sort of let it relax a little bit, then I feel like I can give myself one big push, like a big rush of energy to snap myself out of it and wake up. And I have no idea why it happens. Do you know why it happens? And, and were you medically diagnosed? So yeah, I've had a sleep study before and it picked it up on the exam. And I've been working with um, a sleep doctor and a dentist trying to figure out what's causing it in my body. And the number one cause of sleep paralysis is lack of oxygen. So if you go to sleep and your head is maybe tilted forward because of your pillow and you create a bad incline, you could block your airways. And that causes your body to panic when you're going into the REM sleep mode. And that's why you wake up and you're frozen. Your body's trying to wake itself up out of like a fight or flight response. And that's what causes that scary sensation of being frozen and not being able to leave your body. And that's because the dream chemical is happening while that's going on. You're seeing all that stuff happen to you too. But what's good about what you said is if you kind of concede to it and you don't allow the fear to take over, you can slowly relax yourself and come out of that experience. And that's, I, I call it like the fear cycle where if you wake up in it and you feed the fear, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So if you can cut it off at that fear, you don't feed it the fear, you, you can actually wake up from that. Yeah, my mom used to describe that same condition. We never really knew what it was. But once I met you and we started talking about it, it's like, I think a lot more people experience this, maybe not as frequently as you do. And I don't never remember having great visions of something I'd want to photograph or something I could conceptually put together in a photograph. But it is, it's pretty scary, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's pretty terrifying. I mean, like going through it as a 14 year old kid, it, I mean, even I've had experiences when I was like eight or nine years old too, but it was never reoccurring until my teen years. But it, it really just puts a whole damper on your life. You know, like I was really depressed and, I was in a hole that I never really thought I could have came out of it, but I found art. And that was like my way to talk about something that was so strange or difficult to express to like my friends or my family, because you tell somebody that you wake up and there's somebody floating above your bed. They think you're either possessed or you have like a haunting in your house or you're crazy or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of felt pretty alone. But once I started putting my artwork out there online and sharing my portraits, and, and kind of just expressing my story and what I go through. I got floods of messages from people all over the world saying, I go through the same thing as you. I've gone through that too. And that made me feel less alone. And it kind of just jump started my mission to not just become an artist, but share my story and get other people inspired and share the condition with other people too, because it's widely understudied. 
And mm -hmm. I think if I can spread awareness to it, I can reach that 14 year old kid who's like me somewhere, maybe in Mexico or across the pond where they're suffering and they don't have the resources. If I can use art as a universal language to talk to them and get them the resources they need to learn about their condition, that would make me really happy. Is it possible this condition will go away over time or is this something you're getting treatment for? Or is this something that over time you just learn how to deal with it? So there's ways to combat it. I, I mean, I'll always be susceptible to it until I figure out what is the, the issue. I mean, the breathing thing is one thing, but it's also a neurological thing. And I've had a lot of concussions too. And I'm wondering if that maybe could have sparked something in my brain where the chemistry is like that. We're still doing, I'm going to do another sleep study too, to go more in depth with it. But um, you can sleep on your right side and elevate your heart, which allows your heart to relax a little bit, to put stress on it. You can sleep with the white noise, which, which distracts your brain a little bit. Um, a blindfold helps if you're seeing stuff. You can put the blindfold on, and that way you won't have to see that figure that's floating above your bed. Like I use blindfolds a lot in my images too as like a symbol of that. Um, mm -hmm. And right now I'm working with a dentist. His name is Dr. Seltzer. He, is, he made me this mouthpiece sort of thing that brings my jaw forward when I sleep, and it allows more airflow to go through. And it's, been, it's been working a little bit, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to keep exploring that. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, uh, thank you again for putting together this collection of images we're going to talk about. Um, and let me uh, maneuver the screen and share uh, the slideshow. And let's start talking about these images. And by all means, get into the depths and the details of everything about these images and how you came to this um, stumbling blocks along the way. But everything it took to actually get this anvil to where it was, because I know this is a pretty big story. Um, yeah, this is not something that happens so easily. But what was the dream? What triggered this? What was the creative behind it? And how did you execute it? So the foundation of this image, I wanted to express basically a stereotypical sleep paralysis experience where you're waking up in this situation where you have absolutely no control and you're at the mercy of whatever goes on within your room until the dream ends. So this is a self-portrait that I took. Here I am at this table and I'm, I'm laying across the table with this anvil that's like 80 pounds hanging above my head. And if you can see, the, candle, the candelabra there is slowly burning away at that piece of rope that's holding the anvil, and it's just about to come down and crush the character. Um, so the symbolism within this, the anvil symbolizes the pressure that I feel in my chest that starts to happen as soon as I wake up in a sleep paralysis episode. And it's looming above my head and in the dream, it's looming above my chest. So this visual representation shows what's going on and how I'm feeling within the dream. It's not always, when I create these pictures, they're not always a visual exact representation of what goes on, but I use a lot of symbolism that I've developed, whether it be through building props or making costumes. Um, I've created this visual diary of what I can use in my pictures to make it one, visually enticing, two, share my story, three, just be um, interesting in the composition itself. And in the dream, does, how long does it take you before you snap out of it? For me, I, sometimes I feel like it could take seconds, maybe 30 seconds or so, maybe less than that. Um, how long before you snap out of the dream? So for me, it's funny because like, I know pretty much when I put my phone down, I look at the time as to when I, when I go to bed. So I'll use that as a frame of reference. Um, sometimes I'll go through a dream that feels like I've been in it for like a half hour, but it's only been maybe eight minutes since I've been asleep. Um, and then there are other dreams that where I'll, I'll have a normal dream and then fall into a sleep paralysis episode and then go back into an, a regular dream too, which like totally screws up your, your mental awareness of what time it is, when, how long time was. So going into this world of, of dreams and sleep, it, it's really hard to kind of keep track of everything in the real time. Mm -hmm. So you have this dream, Anvil, the setup, the pressure, everything. Now you come out of that and you go right to your book and you start to craft the creative or you put down what the dream was. Take us on the journey from that to how does all of this end up in the water? Where are you? What camera are you using? What lens focal length are you choosing uh, to get this done? I mean, how do you do that? looks like a hell of a lot to be dragging out to the water. Yeah. So um, after I wake up from the dream, I'm jumping right to my sketch pad or a napkin if I'm in a hotel room, anything that I can just write on quickly or log it in my phone if I have to. Um, I'll log down what I saw, how I felt, 
and that will go into my archive. I'll look through and I'll pick the image I want to shoot. For example, I picked this one and I'm like, okay, I need to build the structure. I need to make a costume or find a costume at like the thrift store. Um, I need to find a candelabra, this anvil. I actually had an anvil in my studio because I use that uh, as part of, it's one of my tools that I use to shape metal. Um, so I sketch out a basic idea of what I need. I start by making these, uh, the costume or the prop. Like for example, I'm using a bunch of reclaimed wood to make this structure that would hang the anvil over. Um, and I'm sewing a, a different type of like tablecloth uh, and I'm finding a suit and I'm weathering the suit with dirt and everything like that to make it look interesting. And then what I'll do is I'll, before I go out on a shoot like this, cause it's pretty complicated of a setup, I'll set it up either in the driveway of my studio or my backyard just before I go out there to see if it'll work like physically. Cause I've, in my earlier parts of my career, I would just go out and wing it. And then sometimes I'd have a disaster of a shoot because like, for example, maybe the anvil was too heavy and it would have tipped over. But, um, in this piece, I, I engineered everything beforehand. I actually brought two of my friends with me to make sure that we could lift up the anvil and get it hooked on there. So this, for this shoot, I actually had two assistants that two of my best friends that I've known since childhood. Um, so we went out there, set up the table, we set up the anvil and all of a sudden the tide rises up. I'm out in Crab Meadow beach in Northport, New York. And originally this was supposed to just be on this little like sandbar of an Island of surrounded mm -hmm. by the water, but the water rose. And I was like, wow, this is perfect because it looks like we're in the middle of a flood. And I use the aspect of water rising in my images as a symbol because, um, for example, if a character is halfway submerged in the water, it's symbolizing the aspect of being stuck in sleep paralysis because below the water is this, the realm of sleep and above is being awake. So they're stuck in between and they're waiting um, between those two worlds. Um, so we set this whole thing up. Uh, I got underneath the anvil, shot that really quick on the interval timer. I have my, my Nikon. I think I shot this with the D810. I'm shooting with the D850 now. Um, so I, I'm using a 50 millimeter 1.4 lens for this. I, I pretty much use the 50 for all my, all my serial photographs. It's just my favorite lens. I feel like it renders life very well. Um, so I, I'm shooting on an interval timer. So that way I can go in front of the camera and model and change my position, modify things, light candles with a blowtorch. It was really windy that day. So it was kind of difficult to light each candle. But mm -hmm. as the interval timer is shooting, I, I, basically collect a whole bunch of images that I can piece together, not like cut and paste, but layer on top of each other so I can have the final composition while working with a minimal budget and minimal assistance, sometimes no assistance at all. And what are you setting the intervals at? Do you, what do you have, one every five seconds, one every 10 seconds? For this, I, um, for the, when I was posing, I think I just did like th uh, four seconds four second interval so I could just move like in and out of the focal plane just to make sure I'm really sharp because like mm -hmm. I, I set it up on manual focus and I kind of have to guess where I have to be to be in focus so I'll just move left and right a little bit so I can have the perfect image for that and then mm -hmm. for the candles I did it on interval of one second because it was so windy and I'm using this blow torch to, to torch each uh, candle to make sure it doesn't go out immediately. And I managed to get all, all of them lit, some of them smoking, which I thought was pretty interesting to add some uh, dynamic to it. Because it's a very um, static image, but there's built up suspense. Like, that's what I want to do. Like, whenever, whenever there's no, um, whenever it's like a static sort of still image, I want there to be some sort of explosion or um, aspect of movement that's about to happen. I think that creates suspense. And you're, you're not, this is not put together in Photoshop. You're bringing this entire set together and you're shooting this picture. But it looks like you're choosing a bit of a flat profile, which I assume is for more of a dreamy effect. Um, what are you doing in the way of color and setting up the file? And what file format are you using? So I'm shooting in RAW. And on my images, I like to add a little bit of a fade. It just kind of keeps the world, again, like you said, in like a dreamy sort of world that I create in. And it also allows my images to kind of be cohesive. Um, especially when I'm shooting on overcast days where sometimes I'll be shooting on like a, like a sunset too. I don't want the blacks to be drastically different when I'm presenting my entire body of work. I try to keep everything pretty uniform. Um, mm -hmm. it's just a style that I've developed and I've, 
I, I'm personally attached to it and my fans seem to love it too. So I, it's just something that I want to express the way it's, it's the way I want to express my work while keeping it. It's, it's photography, but I want it to almost look like a painting too. And a lot of what happens when you print digital photography is you can tell it's digital photography by the, the, the values of the blacks. And I feel sometimes when you do click that, maybe it's not technically the best thing to do to an image, but the way it renders on paper, especially the paper that I use, it, it just, it really looks like a painting once it's presented. And that's just a stylistic choice that I've developed over time. Gotcha. Well, beautiful. I mean, again, I, I, I can't imagine what it would take to get all of this out there, get everything in the water. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I, maybe it's just me. I don't know that I'd be putting my head under an anvil. I don't care how secure it would be. Um, but, um, but it's nice to uh, hear the backstory on this and, and how it all comes together. And, and Northport is where you live, right? That's your area where you yep. uh, come from. I live, grew, up. I grew up here, and my my studio is here now. So I'm, I've just been trying to create in this area and use all the places that I used to go to as a kid. They're kind of like my my catalysts. Where I go when I was younger, I'd go there and explore and dive into the water, go through the mud and find crabs. Like I'll go back to those places where I felt the happiest, and they kind of are. They now serve me as this the the sets for my images, and it's just been kind of like a symbolic thing for me and it just makes me feel good i feel like that energy is there so why not tap into it sure all right let's roll on to the next image um sure. again I, I guess most people would consider these dark obviously coming from the dreams um but uh, again it fascinates me the mind of, of of conceiving all this i guess i would call it fine art photography you call it surrealistic uh photography uh is the way you describe it on your instagram page which those of you are tuning in it's Nicholas Bruno on Instagram, right, Nick? Is that where you're socializing? Yeah, Nicholas Bruno with, with no H. There's no H in my first name. <laughs> N-I-C-O-L-A-S, yep. right? All right, good. I got that down. Uh, talk about this image. Again, take us through the journey of the dream first sure. um, and, and everything that follows after that. Well, like you said before, it, these images that I create, they come, they come off as dark. They're coming from a dark experience, but for me, I'm taking that dark experience jumping into a scenario, photographing it, and then turning it into something positive that I can show to the world. And it makes me feel better because I have complete control within these scenarios that I create, whereas in my dreams, I have zero control. So for me, that's, that's where that, the darkness comes and turns into something light. That's, I guess, the way I look at it. Um, but for this image, I wanted to express the drowning feeling that I get when I wake up in sleep paralysis. Sometimes when I, there's, no, there's no figures walking through the room, I'm not having any hallucinations, I'll feel like I'm being sucked backward into my mattress or being pulled off of my bed by like a tide. So what I wanted to do with this image is showcase this bed that's slowly collapsing inward and my character is slowly sinking into this muddy marshland. Um, so I, I found this bed on the side of the road and I took it, it was originally white and I, I painted it and I scuffed it up to make it look all worn and weathered covered it with some mud. Um, and what I did was I, the bed, like normally on a bed frame, it's straight. Um, I didn't want the bed to be perfectly standing up in the marsh. So what I did was I cut the two uh, bed frame parts and I angled them inward and I bolted them together. So that way the whole bed would stay in one spot and not float everywhere. And it would still look like it was like breaking or getting sucked under. Um, and then I went out there and here I am like trying to sink into the mud here and I'm covered in rope and different types of linens that I made. I tied the pillows up, the one pillow up with the rope. And I thought that was a pretty interesting, like sculptural element. And when I'm creating these pieces, it's, it's basically like performance art because I'm just out there. It's me and my camera and a bunch of stuff that I bring, uh, whether it be I carry it on my back or on in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> and I just do a performance in front of the camera and hopefully that, whatever I've shot on that interval timer will be the next image that I can share with the world. And I think with this piece, it, it's something I've always wanted to do. I didn't really have the idea until I found this spot that's out also in Crab Meadow Marsh where the tide rises all the way up and you can see this really cool little channel going all the way back to the end of the image, like by the horizon line. Um, and I thought that was a pretty cool dynamic shape that I could create with this piece. It's very amazing. Did you bring a crew on this too to help you carry stuff out or does this no, one work on alone? This is just me um, on a crazy rainy day and it was like pouring. I was like, I need to go out in the pouring rain. I jumped out there and then it started to drizzle, but 
I kind of like the drizzle aspect of it. There's something that's like slower. It's slower paced, like as if I'm being slowly sucked downward into the water. Mm -hmm. And in this type of work, once you started creating, are there artists or photographers, fine art people that you looked at for inspiration? And where do you find your inspiration for creative outside the dreams? So I like to look at paintings, specifically 19th century paintings, um, like Goya. Caspar David Friedrich is one of my favorite painters. Um, I'm looking at a lot of digital photographers too that are, that are contemporary, like Joel Robison is really cool. Brooke Shaden's really cool. Uh, I mean, I looked at a lot of musicians as well. I like to jump outside of the photography realm when I'm looking at um, inspiration, just because I don't want to replicate what my contemporaries are doing. I want to do something that's inspired by something that maybe is outside of my medium. And it just, it, it, it expands the line where I can look at a sculpture and be like, maybe I could do something like that, but in photo form or use that pose in mm -hmm. how I'm gonna set up my next shot. Um, and I'm taking those little reference bits and I'm using them and looking at them in my sketches and then I do something completely different inspired by those things. Mm -hmm. What about fa family support, family and friends? What do they think of, of all of this with you and, and, and how do they feel about it? And do they talk to you about it? Originally, um, my parents were kind of confused when I started telling them about what was going on and how I was shooting these images. My mom, she's pretty spiritual. So she brought a priest to my house actually to bless the house to see if she could get rid of the sleep paralysis stuff. But that was, that wasn't until we knew it was this actual medical thing that was going on with me. Um, but since then, my dad, my mom, my sister, they've all been really supportive of me. Uh, my sister will come out on my shoot sometimes and either model for me or she'll like, she'll, if I'm tied up, like tied up to a chair or something like that, she'll actually click the shutter for me if I need that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, my girlfriend's always been there for me and supporting me and it's just been really, I, I was so afraid to share my story with everyone thinking that they would think I was like a freak or something like that, but it really just turned out well. And I just want to encourage anybody that's going through something to use art and use that as your voice because you never know who you might impact. And it's just an easier way to tell your story, especially if you're a shy person like myself, like I was never the person to, to stand up and want to give a speech or anything like that. Um, art is just my way of, of sharing my ideas, my experience, and, and helping other people too through the process. So in this particular shoot, any challenges that came up? I mean, you make it sound so simple. You bring everything out there. You did talk about things floating and you know how you yeah. tied everything together. Um, you're obviously in a weird position. So you, you, I would assume you were using the intervalometer again uh, on this shot, uh, to let it crank off while you're in the midst of performing, as you say, I think that's a great way of putting it. Um, but were there any challenges that you run into it? Any people around, I mean, and any wildlife around that, you know, uh, that causes issues, anything that goes wrong? I think the issue with this piece was, well, I had to go out into the, the muddy marsh. So like I'm out there and my legs, I'm like up, almost up to my waist in mud and I'm walking out there with this bed above my head. Thankfully, I, I do exercise and stuff, so I, it's not a huge difficulty for me, but I'm out there and trying to get this bed to stay in one spot while I'm trying to sink myself. And the one spot that I did choose was pretty shallow, so I actually had to like bury myself into the mud and keep myself down and like press myself down with my legs to, to make sure I was sinking. So otherwise I would just float up. Um, and trying to make the composition work was kind of difficult too to find that perfect little pathway of, of the water and working with like the fog and everything and just being out there completely uncomfortable covered in sulfur disgusting mud and water it's it's really difficult to go through that but that's kind of part of the process where i'm reliving this discomfort that i go through my in my dreams in the real world but i have that i have control over it how i can curate it and if i can go through uh the dream of a woman floating above me and screaming in my ear, I can definitely jump into a marsh and do this sort of thing and relive it, but have it be a positive experience. Well, very, very powerful images. And, and again, thank you for sharing uh, the backstories on that. Um, this I saw recently posted. Um, I'm fascinated by the image. Thanks. And, and I, <laughs> how are you putting this all together? There's a lot of things going on here too. Where are you shooting? It's a little bit different location based on the background. What's going on here? What was the dream? So I've always considered the characters in my dreams to be like messengers. Um, 
because they're they're coming to me for a reason i don't know why so, and they don't speak half the time like one of them um i think two years ago came up he was actually sitting on the edge of my bed and said i can't do this alone so like that was like the one time i was like he spoke to me which was kind of interesting and i that made me think these characters maybe are trying to tell me something as a messenger so for this piece i wanted to create like not like paul revere but a character that's coming to me on a horse and he's delivering me a message and he's got that somber look on his face and that's basically what they look like they're faceless in my picture in my in my dreams they're they don't have faces they're kind of nondescript and they just kind of pierce into you even though they don't have eyes um so i wanted to showcase that character arriving on this horse coming from the, the middle of the ocean in the fog coming to me to tell me something that i don't know um or just to scare me too but that's what i wanted to portray in this image um so that's actually me on that piece on, on the horse it was a self-portrait that I took. I was by myself. What, what horse? This, this is a real horse that you got so, out there? No, no. I'm, I'm 100% against animal cruelty and putting yeah. animals through torture. I, it's like, that's the number one thing I'll never do in my career. Of course, so, I knew. Yeah. But I wanted a horse. So what I did was I got a life-size resin horse. And I had that, and I brought it out to Sands Point Preserve. And I went out on a pretty foggy day, and I carried this huge horse over my shoulder. It was like 100 pounds. Wait, wait, wait. Where do you find a resin horse? You just go Google it, re resin horse? What, what, exactly what do what you did. And thankfully, out east on Long Island, there's a company behind the Fence Studios. They make gigantic horses and, like, lions and all these different things, statues for, I guess, for display or for, for parties. You can rent them. But I ended up finding a horse on their website, and I bought it, and they, they brought it to the, to, the, uh, to the preserve, and I carried it, and I brought it into the middle of the water. I staked it down, and I jumped up there on the horse while the camera was shooting on the interval, and I soaked the sheet so it would like, hang down heavy, heavy, and you can see all those different lines and ripples, because other, otherwise it would just be blowing in the wind. Um, mm -hmm. I found that if you soak the sheet, it looks a little bit more sculptural, and that's something that I want to portray within the work. And I got up onto the horse, covered myself, and I put the rope around so you could see the definition of like my eye sockets and my nose there. And the camera was shooting and I, I got the shot, came back, took the horse out of the water, brought it home and started editing. It's, it's, it sounds like there's a lot of like physical stuff that goes on during the pieces that it's hard to describe because I kind of like black out in a way when I'm shooting these things. I'm like, I'm in the mode, I get in the mode and I'm, I'm going, I'm, I got my adrenaline pumping got that horse in the water. I, I had to make sure it didn't tip over. It was a lot of like trial and error, but it worked out. We got a step stool on the other side of the horse. I mean, how do you mount that horse without knocking that's, it over? <laughs> that's exactly what I did. I brought a little step stool and I jumped up there and I, I think I got up on the horse like four or five times before I got the shot that I wanted. Um, but that's right. just part of it. It's an experiment. You know, you never know what you're going to create. And I feel like creative paralysis is something that I do get stuck in sometimes where it's like, I have these crazy ideas, but I don't know if they're going to work. But until you go out there and try it, you're never going to make the piece. So you might as well just go try it, you know? So is that how you get past that creative kind of block? Just work it and work it and work it until it ends up where you want it to be? Especially if you can break down the unknowns. Like that, that's the number one thing for me, and I'm sure for a lot of other creators too. Like what if it stops raining or what if there's no fog or what if I can't get onto the horse? Like, if you can break down those unknowns, like in your, again, like in your driveway, like I do at my studio where I set up the horse and I jump up on it and see if I can get up there by myself. If I can't, I'll bring a step ladder. It's like, you just have to figure out what stuff you'll need to bring to make it as efficient as possible, especially when you're working with other people that model for you. But I like to, I mean, I'm, most of my images are self portraits and it kind of cuts out the, uh, the aspect of having to make other people go through these stressful situations as I would want them to have to do that. But, mm -hmm. um, so Try being your own model. Like that's one thing that I would recommend too. Even if it's not the final image, just do, try it yourself to see what goes on. Are you on the water's edge where you're putting a tripod out on land? Or it seems like in each situation, you've got to be put, mounting the camera and the tripod in the water. It, my camera is normally like dangling above the water on a tripod or something makeshift wherever I am. Like For example, if I'm at a pond, sometimes I'll bring like a wooden board and I'll lay the wooden board across the edge of the pond and I'll put my camera on that. Um, I just love to have like the water pouring towards the camera and it creates this really cool like blurry depth effect. Um, that's something that I really like to look for in my images. This piece, um, I was, I, the, cam the camera's up pretty high and not as 
high as I normally do it when I'm shooting because I had to actually work with the scale of the horse, which is something I've never done before. Because normally my mm -hmm. characters are either halfway submerged or they're sitting or laying down. Um, so having a, a standing up image was something different for me. So but, you're done with the horse, you return it back to the people you borrowed it from or you bought the horse? I actually bought it because I'm going to be using it for a lot more pictures. I figured like if I can do that, get the horse and then experiment with it more and create a series just based on that, like that'd be pretty interesting. Well, yeah, I've said this to you before. I'm going to say it publicly in front of everybody here. One, I would love to be a model in a Nicholas Bruno production, <laughs> but if you need somebody to help you carry a horse, I'm happy to do that too. That's, um, that's, that's pretty fascinating. Again, I saw this online. I was like, I got to know what the story is about this. Sure. And here we go again. Um, I've seen this picture before. Um, talk about it. Give us all the details of, of how all this came together. Sure. Um, I shot this actually for the Nikon feature that we did for the D850, which was an amazing experience. Um, this is another self-portrait that I've taken. What I wanted to do, again, it, it's sort of in the realm of the anvil picture where my character's waking up in this situation and in this, I'm actually I'm soaked in water, being doused with water as soon as I wake up in the picture. And there's this candelabra next to me and the whole table's bursting into flames. And when I use fire in my pictures, that symbolizes the anxiety that I get as soon as I wake up. Because you'll wake up sometimes in an episode and be, you'll think everything's normal and you, just, you try to get out of bed and you can't move. And then you get that burst of anxiety in your chest. At least that's what I get. Um, so when I use fire, that's, that's the symbol for the anxiety that I get in the dreams. Um, and it's actually, instead of the candle being lit, the candles are actually being burst and melted and they're, they're pouring down and the candelabra is turning black and the table uh, cloth is actually burning. You can see there's water there on the, on the floor splashed on the ground and there's water dangling off of me too. Um, I just wanted to kind of play with the two elements of being one with the anxiety and the fire and two the water being the, the realm of sleep and that's covering me and pouring off of me as I'm waking up in that anxiety. Where, where'd you take this picture? This I shot in Ashrokin Beach in uh, Northport. Mm -hmm. Well, it's actually technically just Ashrokin, but it's Long Island. And most times you're isolated. Are you ever at that point where somebody, you know, you start to build a crowd around you? I mean, are people seeing you look a lot closer <laughs> Uh, to uh, to being placed by civilization as opposed to being out, you know, in the middle of the woods or the lakes. Um, do you ever draw a crowd? And do you have to deal with that? It's difficult to shoot crazy scenarios like this one, especially because like Long Island is the place to like walk your dog or go outside and hang out. It's pretty densely populated. So for me, it's hard to find those spots. So what I'll do is I will go out on those really rainy overcast days or I'll go out on a freezing December day and shoot something totally crazy because no one will be around. I'm, I'm always a little bit anxious when I do go do my shoots because people have stopped and been like, what are you doing? Or sometimes they'll like call the cops on me or, um, I was going to say, you think somebody would call the fire department thinking this table's on fire and not really understanding what you're doing. Exactly. Well, thankfully this was on my friend's beach that he has a beach. So I went there and shot it because I knew I was going to burn something. I'm not going to do that on public property. He had, I had his permission. So I did that there. And it's not like when I do a fire image like this, it's not burning and I let it burn forever. It's, it burns and I put it out. Like that's basically what it is. There's no, there's no danger to it. Um, and is your, friend, is your friend helping you out throwing the water on you here to create that splash? Or are you doing yes. that to yourself? He, he poured the water on for me. Because I, I was thinking about like how I was going to do that myself, like have the bucket on my lap or whatever. He just volunteered to do it, which was cool. But he was kind of like my audience for this shot. He kind of wanted to see what I was doing during this, this picture, which was cool. And, um, and again, like another, that. another, I'm sorry, finish. No, I, I think it's cool to have an audience, especially when your audience knows your work and they know what you do because they could make a recommendation or maybe they catch something like, Oh, your, your suit jacket is pulled up on one side and you, you forget about that. And you'd go and edit it. Like if you weren't with somebody, you would have never caught that idea. Um, but it's cool to just be with people that you care about. And that's why I primarily almost exclusively work with, my close friends or my family when I do my pictures. You, you mentioned it before, but uh, talk about the focal length. What lenses you go to lens for this kind of stuff? The 50 millimeter 1.4 is what 51. I'm going to use. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like it just, it creates a uniform um, representation of how I would want to render something. If I were to paint, like if I were to paint a scene, like that's how I would want it to look. And I found that that lens is perfect for me. 
And nothing here create, can constructed in Photoshop, all done in the moment of making the picture. That, that's my goal, to shoot everything. Everything has to happen in front of the camera. That's kind of my philosophy for how I shoot pictures because, I mean, Photoshop is amazing. I love it, and I love when people create images with Photoshop. Um, I don't, I don't want to let Photoshop become a crutch for me. So what mm -hmm. I do is I want to make sure everything is real and happening, and it just kind of challenges your brain to use – different mediums it challenges it to to construct things that maybe never would have existed in real life especially when creating surreal photography like how am i going to have water pouring off of my head without somebody standing there so like what i can do is i can just have him pour it jump out of frame and then it's all dripping off of me um right just it's i just want it to be as real as possible because having a, a level of realism within surrealism makes it successful otherwise it's just kind of pure chaos understood all right, so now we have more than just a self-portrait. We've got some other elements going on. Uh, this one kind of freaks me out a little bit, but it's very, very interesting. Uh, yeah. What's happening here? So this is a personally a powerful image that I've, that I've always wanted to create. Um, this is actually my girlfriend in the image modeling with me. Um, as I was suffering when I was 15 years old, um, I was, I, we actually started dating when I was 15. We're still dating now, which is really cool. Um, but... I, I kind of went into that pit of depression and I almost didn't want to connect with my family, didn't want to connect with her. And I felt that the sleep condition was actually driving a wedge between everything that I loved and myself. And I felt like it was always looming over the connection between, especially me and my girlfriend. Like it was hard for me to express the difficulties that I was going through with her. So in this, we're, we're talking on this like antique looking can phone and this hand is coming right up from under the water, which I, the water symbolizes the realm of sleep. It's coming up into the waking life and trying to cut our connection with the scissors. Um, so I wanted to kind of express the aspect of sleep paralysis that it can drive a wedge between the people that you and you love, whether it be through communication or you just going out and trying to interact with them. What, what's your girlfriend's name? Alyssa. Well, obviously very supportive of what you do to get in the water like this and model with you. Um, is there a third person there? What's going on with that barrel? How you got that whole barrel thing set up with the hands coming out? <laughs> so that barrel is um, basically what you would do with that type of barrel is you would use that in blacksmithing, like example with the anvil. You, once you're done heating your object, that barrel is normally filled with water and you would soak your piece of metal and it would quench it. Um, so I, I had one of those. So I brought that with me and I filled that with water and I brought it down into the water there. And I, I went into the barrel and stuck my hand up and held the scissors to, to model for that, for the hand character. Um, my camera is pretty low to the water and the tide was coming in with this. And this was actually the picture that caused the demise of my Nikon D600 because the tide knocked over my camera. It went directly into the water. <laughs> and I salvaged the memory card though, thankfully, but the camera was toast. But mm. if you ever drop your camera in salt water, you can take the memory card out and clean it with fresh water and just rub it off with a Q-tip or maybe a little bit of alcohol and you can actually salvage the pictures. Yeah, I've actually had memory cards go in the, the washing machine several times and they come out dried on the other end and the pictures are still horrible uh, that I shot, but it uh, doesn't help them one bit. But no, I've had that happen to me before. I mean, I guess that's the beauty of solid state. Uh, never feel like you got to throw that away. Right. But this is, this is an amazing image again. And uh, uh, so is this, is this a multiple exposure in a way? So if you're in the barrel, so you're taking several pictures and then constructing that in Photoshop after, or how are you doing that? Correct. So the original image is us both with the can phones set up as the tide is rising and the barrel is in the middle. And then for the second image, I jumped down low and I went in with my arm and had the hand coming up with the scissors to shoot that gotcha. and layer those two on top of each other just to express that. I could have had a third person, but if I can do this all myself, why not do it? You know, I feel like working by yourself teaches you to be resourceful. And if you can use yourself as a model, it's worth doing. Beautiful. I, I guess I couldn't be the stand in model for your girlfriend. So she had to do this one, but Probably think not. of a role for me. All right. Continue okay. to think about a role that I can play. It's going to all of it. Um, this one again, another a pretty scary image to me, but uh, talk about this and what's going on here. 
So this image, I wanted to express the aspect of being tormented by the figures that come in through my room, whether it be they burst through the door or they just appear right in front of me. Um, I've actually symbolized myself as the person, the escape artist. That's what this image is titled. He's tied to this chair, but he's found a way to push himself forward and begin running away while being bound. And that the aspect of being bound to something and trying to escape is what I wanted to express within my dreams where I'm trying to break out of this, this paralysis that I can't fight, but sometimes I can maybe wiggle my finger or do something, maybe move my foot a little bit. And that little bit of a moment, momentum gets me to leave the dream. And that's something that I'm trying to do within this, this image here. That, that really adequately describes what we try to do when you are in this moment. It's pretty, it's pretty phenomenal what you have going here. Now, are we dealing with multiple models here? Are you doing the same thing, three different pictures so those uh, with are you all, in different places? Yes, those are all me in this image. Um, and that's part, of like, that's part of the process too, where even if you can tell some of my images, they're all me in the image, it's all, I'm trying to express something that's happening internally in my own head. I'm basically fighting myself in those dreams because it's all part of me too. So I can become the protagonist and the antagonist within the dream. And that expresses what goes on in my pictures. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, this, I set up on the interval timer and I'm, I'm basically running up and down this trail over and over and over to make sure I got the, the correct shot uh, and to make sure I was in focus. I think I shot this at um, 1.8 F 1.8 for this. And I had to, make sure I got in a really good pose directly on that focal line there. Cause I'm shooting on manual focus. Um, right. So it, it took a long time. I think this shoot took maybe like an hour and a half just of me running back and forth. And it's like a crazy physical process to try to do these types of things. But um, it's well, all I, I would say so while well, you're tied to a chair. <laughs> yeah. Like I um, sometimes wonder if I could do like a funny video series where I do like Nicholas Bruno workouts where like, I'm like lifting an anvil or like carrying a bed or something like that, like mm -hmm. as a joke, but it's really physically exhausting to do a lot of these pictures, but it's all worth it in the end. And I think it, that level of realism really helps the surreal pictures when they get posted online. I think for one of the projects you worked on with us, you also did a behind the scenes video for those of the people tuning in, for those people tuning in, do you have uh, videos posted online as well that show the construction of all this? Yeah, I do. I think they're on my IGTV and they should be on Facebook too. I think maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll repost them so people can see them because we did a lot of cool stuff, like especially for the image where I built the room with the, the, the framed image of the, the boat, there's water pouring out of it. I built like a fake wall and had water pouring through it. So I, I can definitely put the videos up for that. Yeah, that, that's very, very cool. People love to see the behind the scenes. So yeah. again, thank you for sharing that. Um, lots of things going on here. Yeah. What's the dream? So um, in this piece, this was like probably one of the most difficult shots that I had to do just because of the physics of balancing the ladder and keeping it from tipping over and keeping the candles lit. Um, so this character, he's ascending out of the world of sleep, which is below the water, the water, and he's coming up and fighting with these characters that are trying to pull him back under. And all of their, their flames are extinguished, but his is lit, if you can see that at the top. Um, and they're trying to steal his light. And I wanted this to symbolize like me being kind of encapsulated in their world and trying to escape, but they're trying to steal my light, which is like my happiness or my comfort or a sense of being just myself and not attached to their world. And they're trying to steal that. And my character has to decide, does he jump off this ladder into the water and extinguish his own light? Or does he continue to climb even though there's nothing left? Um, it's kind of just like a mental struggle. And I don't think there's a real end to this picture. It's more of like a, a representation of what I get stuck in and what I'm left with when I wake up and have to think about these dreams. Um, so that was kind of like the, the basis behind this. It's more subconscious than an exact conscious description of this, of this picture. Um, but it seems like the camera is real close to the water level. No, I mean, you got, you've got to have that tripod pretty much buried. Yeah, and like for example, this is where in the, a scenario where I laid the, the piece of wood across the bottom of the of the pond, and I, I put the camera right up on top of that. Um, I set up the ladder first. I, basically, what I did below the ladder, I built a structure like an A-frame, and I weighted it down with sandbags so it wouldn't tip over because wood wants to float. Um, so I set up the ladder where it needed to be, and I focused on the ladder with the manual focus set on the interval for, I think, I think six seconds for this because I was able to move a little bit slower 
and I didn't want to move too fast because the ladder might have tipped over. Um, so I shot me and all the different bottom characters first where I'm wading back and forth. I'm covered in rope around my arm. Um, and then I, I took a little smoke bomb, lit it so I could get the smoke trailing behind each one of the candles. And then for the last image, I knew that the ladder was going to tip. So I had to do it really fast. I set up the interval, for, I think, for two seconds. I climbed up. I held the pose, the camera shooting, shooting, and then the, the ladder slowly tipped, and I just fall into the water. And I was like, I really hope I got that shot because I just spent an hour shooting this whole thing. Um, and thankfully, I, I got it. It was in focus, and it worked. But there are shoots where I go out there, and I'll, I'll spend a ton of time setting up, shooting, and then something didn't work or maybe the, the prop tipped over or the tide rose. There's so many variables that could happen, especially when the sun comes out on the middle of an overcast day. Um, mm. That can screw up a whole shoot if you're trying to piece everything together. But sure. again, it blows the continuity, process. right? It just blows the continuity. Yeah, it can destroy a process. But then it's like, then you can go out and try it again or maybe try something different or put that idea off for a different day. I think... Mm -hmm. Something that I'm trying to get in the, the swing of is do the easiest image first. I always like to do like the complicated ones, but then it's been like a month or two months since I posted a picture. I'm like, wow, I haven't, I haven't shared anything. But I'm trying to get into that mode of shooting the more, well, not, not easy to do, but the more efficient images first. That's something I'm trying to do this year. Unbelievable. Just uh, pretty insane. Let me uh, bring you back to full screen here. Uh, that's, that's pretty fascinating. And, uh, as long as I've known you to, to dig into some of these stories and get the depth behind, you know, all of this is, uh, is, is fascinating. And I hope everybody tuning in feels the same way. Uh, it, as I'm looking at these pictures, it's almost like a bittersweet thought that I have of, you know, the last thing you want is for somebody to suffer with a condition. Yet at the same time, this is what drives your art. Do you ever think about like, if you are free of sleep paralysis, you know, where your art would go at that point? I mean, or do you feel like this is just a lifelong condition and you'll deal with it and that's where the art's going to keep being generated from? You know, I, I feel, I think about that a lot. And if it did go away, I feel like I would still have endless amounts of inspiration just from what I've gone through throughout my life and um, the logs that I've made and the, the friends that I've made in the art community and all these inspirations that have come just from taking that one step to write down what I'm experiencing. And I feel like um, if it went away, it would be okay because I can still share my experiences. But I just want to encourage other people to keep a journal, experiment with art, jump, on, jump in front of your camera if you don't have a model and try something. Because all those little experiences can just bring you out of, even if it's just a, a little bit of sadness or if you're really deep into depression, it can be a great way to express yourself and share with the world and allow other people to relate with you too. Have any other people with a condition of sleep paralysis ever approached you and said, Nicholas, you know, this is the vision I had. Is that an avenue for you to possibly start photographing portraits of other people going through the same condition or have you done that already? So what I did originally was I allowed people to submit anonymously their dreams to like this forum that I'd set up so people could share it. And what was cool about that in my research, going through them all, I could find aspects that were all very similar across the board, whether it be somebody from Chile or somebody from America or Canada, like there's, there's these characters that constantly reappear. And it makes me just wonder, like, as humans, why do we all experience this one, like similar thing? Why is this a part of our experience? And that's something that I'm trying to uncover through my work. And I'm looking forward to doing more portraits for people. Um, I've done a few where people have sent me their dreams and I've created them as a personal piece for them. Um, and I'm looking forward to working on a VR, a virtual reality experience. That's something I've been working on developing for a while. I just haven't shot it yet. That's something I'm trying to do as soon as possible. So other people can put on this VR headset, look at what's going on in the world of sleep paralysis, and maybe learn a little bit more about what's going on. That's beautiful. And, and again, as we opened up, I said uh, we'd be talking about your personal experiences. So we thank you for sharing those. Um, obviously, it's critical to telling the stories behind the pictures. Uh, folks tuning in, definitely check out Nicholas's Instagram page and his uh, Instagram TV page or wherever you've got videos posted. Uh, his website uh, has some great uh, content as well. Uh, Nicholas, I can't thank you enough for spending some time with us. Um, uh, for those of you, we mentioned earlier how we met. Uh, we spoke together. We had a chance to 
speak together to the students of the Huntington Camera Club after you became big and famous, uh, and uh, where we do award uh, young artists uh, with cameras uh, based on the competitions, the photo competitions. So it's nice to see you, how you've grown, you know, from very local competitions in Huntington uh, that were put together, great group of people that run that program, and, and where you are now. Where do you see, as we close out, where do you see your future going at, at all? You talked about the gallery. That'll open up again. Yeah. Um, where are you going to go with all this? I just want to keep creating, doing exhibitions, trying different um, aspects of creating, like whether it be through sculpture, jumping into more photography aspects of things that I've never really got to create before. As I'm exhibiting more and saving my money, I'd like to do more grand ideas where I'm bringing in maybe multiple characters that are not me and allowing other people to model for me too. I just want to explore and see what goes on within my dreams, other people's dreams, and just spread awareness of the condition. Beautiful. Well, thank you again so much for your time. Those of you tuning in, it was a great hour with Nicholas. Uh, check out NikonUSA.com backslash creators hour to see more great content and interviews with ambassadors and epic photographers uh, and some tips about photographing during these challenging times while we were, are in quarantine, even as we come out of it. Go out there, guys. Make some great, great pictures. Share them with us. We hope you were inspired. And for Nikon, I am Mike Corrado. Everybody be, out, be safe out there, and we'll see you soon.